number of um, individuals from across various parts of the world, even adopting Chia, they said it is probably the best expression to, to adopt by all parliaments throughout the world because it was, it, it was a capsule of the sentiments that had been heaped in their chest and there to express your disgust um, about something done or said or about an individual whom you denigrate. Just say Chia and the world will be at peace. <laughs> but I took my time um, as a scholar to do a very comprehensive, I must say it was one of the best analysis that I as a scholar of all these years that I've been deliberating um, that I had done. And um, it, it simply, I, you know, described it as a denunciative expression, um, expressing your utter, not just disgust, but extreme disgust. It was a capsule and interjection which doesn't bear additional, bear for you to add more words. It was a summary. And within the situation where it was uttered by an anonymous person in the crowd, it was probably one of the weapons of the weak, socially deprived, who in the face of very dominant and powerful figures um, would, would hide behind a simple expression that can be uttered within a split second. It says for you all that you could have said um, by raising your hand and articulating and speaking for 15 minutes. That single expression maybe was the most effective weapon that those socially deprived could use um, as to release stress, the stressful situation under which he was. Um, this was one of the best reliefs. And successfully, whoever spoke the tree was never discovered and will never be discovered. So it was a way of strengthening, maintaining a power balance between the bigger people and the powerful people and the helpless and the bomb rower who otherwise would be afraid. So God gave them such interjections as a way of fighting tyranny. I, I was trying to see whether there are any publications you have made. And a popular one that you did not include, unless I haven't read the CV well, Woes of the Quatrot. Or how do you pronounce it? Uh, it was a coinage, and it, it doesn't have an established pronunciation in the dictionary. Um, yes, um, I did this CV without adding any publication because it wasn't requested. And then when in the final rounds of time the loose ends I came to the secretariat, they thought because I've been a professor and teacher for such a long time, it would be unfortunate if I left out um, the publications. So that's what I tried to summarize uh, there. Uh, and I left out quite a number of things and, and publications, but I, it was important, a literary work, but I just summed it up um, by not necessarily expressing it on the list of publications. But there are so many others that I haven't listed. Um, I didn't see anything related to your activities around the Dons, the Logia, and Unicasa. You know, you life, mean on his CV? Yes. Oh, please. Life is a long process, and um, it's been impossible, significant. I wouldn't say significant. Every detail, I'm sure you wouldn't have uh, wanted to spend. Chairman wanted four, me to ask whether four, you five five still hours, yeah. want to be a choir master. Oh, of the. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I wasn't part you're, of the you're out of, you're out of choir masters, I can say yes. that. Um, I, oh, Chair, please ignore him. Thank he you. wanted me to ask you that, and I declined. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> Chairman. Yes, I know global. Titus Global. Prof, congratulations. Thank you so much, Titus. I respectfully want to take it to big six. Mm -hmm. Um, others, under others, September 2016, Association of Commonwealth Universities Conference paper, Corporate Social Responsibility in the Private Universities. You chaired it. Is that what? Is it again? Page six. Yes, bullet. Bullet three. From the top. Oh, oh, from the top. Okay, okay. Um, under Corporate Social Responsibility, 
in the private universities. Can you share with us under the principles of the three Ps, the people, the places, and profits? Similar uh, example with your, your university. Can you help us to share with us uh, under corporate social responsibility? Oh, what were some of the recommendations? I made reference to some of the programs that the University of um, Central University has, which are integral to the process of acquiring a degree, and that included community service. And, and, and I, I showed ample examples of service that had been conducted by students in various parts of Accra and beyond. I gave examples of um, work done by the chaplaincy uh, which extends ministration to various parts of Ghana, uh, particularly the northern part of Ghana. And then picked on a number of institutions that many of the students have been working um, over the period in the past um, eight to ten years. Um, yes. So largely, mostly community work and internships that students have done, but largely dwelt on the community service that uh, our students undertake as part of um, ways of fulfilling their responsibilities and getting a degree from Central University. In congratulating our own Professor Kwesi Yanka. My chairman, my difficulty, I know the weight of his academic record, but I see in the name Professor Kwesi Yanka. Certainly, he could not have been baptized a professor. And therefore, I was finding it very, very difficult to remind my own professor that he was born Kwesi Yanka. And therefore, the records should reflect, but appreciating that he earned a professor. Chairman, I can only be polite in asking my professor. That's what he taught me to do, <laughs> to be diligent. And that therefore, if he looks at page one, name, Professor Kwesi Yanka, should read Kwesi Yanka. Thank you very much. Uh, that's exactly what I did. But my attention was drawn to this by the secretariat. And if they are, they are here, they will confirm it. Thank you that they would prefer it if I added the title. But I presented it very, yes. I presented it very nakedly <laughs> without the title, please. But Prof, having worked in the public, uh, having worked in the public university and now in the private university, you have shared two important worlds. Will you recommend some pedagogical changes going forward for our public universities? Well, I wouldn't say that one is superior to the other, for which reason one should borrow uh, from the other. But I realize there are two entirely different worlds. Uh, one, of course, they work towards the same objective um, of producing middle to high level manpower to serve the needs of the nation. That is a standard expectation of all universities, whether they are private or public. The responsibilities of a leader um, in the private university are somewhat different. Um, I mean, I'm not saying they are any less difficult or more difficult, but slightly different in operating entirely with fees from admissions. You are not expecting any subvention from government to pay salaries at the end of the month you are looking to your own creative ways of raising funds to run the university. So getting to the middle of every month where we pay 
the first part of the salary, and particularly getting to the end where a greater part of the salary is suspected, you virtually sit on tenterhooks and ask, asking yourself, where am I going to get money to pay 450 or so workers that rely entirely on fees from admission? So you ought to adopt various strategies of ensuring that you mount courses that are in high demand. Unfortunately for private universities, um, there is what has been called a mission creep, where there is very little differentiation in terms of course content. And almost everybody is doing everybody, everybody's work, or everybody's doing uh, every course or every program. It challenges you to ensure that uh, you cover a niche with certain areas of excellence that your university should be known for, and for which reason um, students would rather, should prefer um, subscribing to your university and not others. So there's greater competition, and so therefore you have to be more creative in, in meeting the competition. Chairman, my follow-up would be to with your experience again at the University of Ghana and going into Central University, I should note that it should be a fact that many Ghanaian parents and Ghanaian students struggle to be able to raise their fees to enter the private universities relative to what existed in the public uh, uh, universities. Will you advocate that a means test becomes necessary as government policy to know who deserves what in terms of government support by way of financing higher education? Well, the impression that private universities are more expensive, um, that is almost a myth in that over the years, the gap within the fees between private and public universities, that gap is narrowing. Um, there are quite a number of courses, particularly in the sciences, where the public universities charge higher than the private universities, particularly if you consider those paying from within the fee-paying category. Yes. Um, quite a number of courses now attract two categories, those who are non-fee paying and who are there, quote and unquote, for free, but you and I know it's not for free because they are paying um, tuition, one type of a foof, academic facility user fee, residential facility user fee, or the other. So the, the difference, as I speak now, um, is not really much. But I think there is the impression that the public universities are much more established, um, have a much longer history, academic experience. And the impression is that maybe the private universities that started not too long ago, I would rather apply to A. If I don't get A, I go to B. But the situation is fast changing, and many students and applicants are looking for the university that will best serve their needs, regardless of the category to which they belong. Question to Professor Kwesi Yanka would be, in the 90s, you together with other concerned Ghanaians within academia were very much concerned about access, relevance, and quality to higher education. It appears that with the birth of private universities and expanded access to higher education, we are about resolving the access problem, if you look at the leap in terms of numbers. Now, with relevance and quality, I just want your opinion. You find many of our universities drifting away from their core mission, University of Science and Technology. What was the core mission and vision. University of Kepkos 
what was the primary vision in your own University of Ghana. Share your thoughts. What you, would you want to see different as you head the tertiary education wing of the ministry in support of the president? It's quite clear that many universities have evolved over the years and in so doing left behind the original mandate for which they were established. Cape Coast was largely for science education. Um, Legon started as a liberal arts, even though it was on, 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 on their cards, they intended eventually to roll out science and engineering programs from their own experience. Now, it looks to me as if the, the public universities, which were originally not struggling for survival, have reached a point where they realize that government subvention has been going down and has moved away from the original practice where subventions were given even over five yearly intervals to a point where even the yearly subventions uh, are not coming forth as quickly as expected and they have to negotiate their way through getting subventions. So this has compelled them to violate um, a norm that shouldn't be violated by many such universities, namely moving away from the differentiation and diversification that one would expect uh, with several universities. Everybody is developing programs and courses apart from satisfying the national needs, but largely also to ensure that they survive um, as a university. That's, that's a very unfortunate development. I think it is one area that we should be looking at ensuring that universities stick to their core mandate as far as this is possible and avoid what has been called mission creep that is creeping gradually away from the original mission and then moving into a state of what has been called asomorphism, asomorphism I must say, everybody doing the same. So the absence of a differentiation is now the, the challenge you know, what is the niche of this particular university? Look through the spectrum of courses, virtually the same. Um, science and technology, yes, they started in that mode, but gradually they have about a 32% non-science courses, or 32% enrollment in non-science areas in the humanities. And that is also good, they are satisfying the demand but it doesn't encourage the younger universities to also seek to cover a niche for themselves as centers of excellence for particular programs. Chairman, I believe this should be my last pretense of the professor for the portfolio of the ministry. Uh, but Prof, as we trust that you will partner our young colleague to resituate higher education to respond to the contemporary needs of Ghanaian society. I find in your CV, and I know that defines you, the culture of reading, the culture of reading in Ghana. How can we rely on your expertise to improve it? I mean, if you travel to Europe and America, even in the morning, the political elite, everybody wants to know what is in the headlines, what is behind the headlines, access to it, children. In Ghana, you know better. How can we improve the culture of reading? And Chairman, I end it there. Thank you very much. Congratulations, um, Prof. Thanks. So, our attitude to reading, even by the roadside, elsewhere outside the country and, and, and yonder, um, people waiting at bus stops or train stops for the train or vehicle to come, everybody's reading either one storybook or the other. The culture here is completely different. Come with me to even your own experiences on when you are traveling in planes. The entire number of uh, passengers in the plane, depending on which 
area they are coming from. Many of them are reading, except maybe the Africans, <laughs> doing one thing or the other. Or to, to South Africa, where I landed once at Johannesburg, and there was this Ghanaian lady, um, apparently completely lost, having lost her way to um, the gate, was going to Port Elizabethville, and pleaded with me to help her identify the gate, even though they had clearly written one, two, three, four, five, six, or A, B, C, D. I had to hold her hand and go directly to the gate and help her. But it has to really start from beginning. Reading as a culture, several parts of Europe and other parts of the world, parents read to their children, read them to sleep virtually, you know, till they doze off. And they c gradually imbibe the culture without even noticing that they are learning how to read. And this is even the work of the parent himself or herself. You haven't even moved to the school where many of them at the level of kindergarten are reading, are learning to read. We don't have that culture here. And I'm sure you are aware of um, the survey done by the uh, Minister of Education where at a certain point in time, just about 2% of primary school uh, children could read and write in English or any Ghanaian language. That was a very scary thought. And considering that throughout the life of a student, reading is the most important means by which they imbibe knowledge. Uh, it means for the rest of the period, you can completely rule the person out in secondary education and at the university level, they are completely out. If you don't find ways and means of reintroducing reading into their academic um, skills and culture, and that is where the libraries come in. That is where we have to work together with the minister um, to continue the good work done by our predecessors um, in boosting reading and ensuring that there's enough textbook, there are enough textbooks uh, for them and go to the rural areas where some of the teachers during the reading period don't have enough reading books and have to write on the board, line by line, writing the book on the board. And just imagine you know, the, the, the plight of such students and how they are going to be as good as those in Accra, for that matter for whom books uh, are not a problem. Yes, from three years to um, four years. Will you share with us your take on that in the current times? Thank you, calling to me when the exams council invited me to um, be one of their, to be their speaker for 2014 in, the, in their uh, four yearly series. Uh, which rotates from one country to the other. And I thought I needed a weighty topic such as this one. So from the three-year SHS, which was actually introduced as far back as 1988 uh, by the Vance report, and was eventually also taken up by the Anamwa Mesa report uh, in the early 2000. Um, and the Anamwa Mesa report also said three years, as far as the report was concerned. But the white paper, which is actually the voice of government, um, said no, the three years from our experience uh, would not be enough, and that the children need a, a little more time of contact hours to ensure that the syllabus is uh, successfully accomplished. So the four year was introduced by the white paper on the Anamua Mesa report. Um, now, it so happened that government has introduced a four year project, but shortly after the four year had taken off, 
came the men's government, um, which asked us to swing back to the three-year, because the three-year project is much less expensive, um, and that if we manage our programming well, the students will be able to accomplish what would have been done in four years in a three-year period. And it was quite obvious that um, maybe not much time had been taken to compare the three and four years to determine which of them uh, put the um, students in a better state. Um, so I decided after having seen the three-year operate for six years, the three-year period before the four years started, and then the period after the four years, it gave us ample opportunity to do a, and take a critical analysis and compare the results. So that is what I did and realized that in almost every subject, from A to about 25 subjects that are done, the four years were doing much, much, much better across the board, with, with a single exception of a certain category of um, high schools where there wasn't much difference, whether it is three or four years. They will still score their 90% or 98% in English. But for uh, the, the, the rest, which who are in the majority, 85%, um, nearly 90% across board, and even in schools where they scored say 1%, that is A1 to C6 um, in English, you could see some progress, maybe from 1% to 3%. And I was telling everybody, you know, even for them, it was a celebration, no matter how limited the celebration was. So my recommendation in that analysis, after having done a thorough um, analysis of the situation over a period of 10 years, was that the four year gives much more time, con many more contact hours to the students. Um, but at the same time, within the three years, if you take a good look at the three year and the structure of the three years, you would realize that the three years are actually two years, the amount of time the student taking, being assigned in the CSSP program, and the victims are still those in the rural areas who were not immediately given uh, the schools that they applied for. Those in the, in the bigger schools are already gone and have started classes in September. And your children and mine, uh, so to say, uh, from the rural areas will be groping in the dark and will be spending four months just looking for the placement. So essentially, it's about two years and a few more months. If we are able to remove those structural impediments, um, we may then test whether the true three-year period um, unencumbered by those distractions, whether that would be enough or not. But in the meantime, I said, yes, four years enable uh, the student to have, even in math, and elective math, physics, you could see that even in the rural areas that you and I care for, because they are in the majority, but they are always uh, downtrodden in terms of availability of books. Even they were doing much better, and some were scoring, scoring double, you know, the percentage that they scored um, within the three-year period. So I advocated um, a, a flexible mode um, where students or schools would be given the opportunity to, particularly those that do not really need the four years. Because the Wesley girls and so on were still scoring the highest, whether two or four or three years. Uh, but for the majority, I think we better settle for the four years. But open a window, making it possible for those who want to access it by three years to go ahead and do it, because they are capable of doing it. The curriculum that is developed in our schools is it tailored to the job market in recent times? And what, what is your view on that? For, um, university industry in that interface, 
for a long time. And I think the situation has improved tremendously. You now have a um, board of governors um, of various universities, you know, with, with a substantial number of individuals from industry so that they would influence policy right from the top. You now have uh, schools um, and faculties that have um, governing boards where they have ensured that the curriculum would be made or constructed with the help of those in industry. Um, we, you now have job fairs in several universities. Um, you now have internships where we make sure that the students get an experience of industry um, even before they finish school to smoothen the transition between school and work. Something is being done, but I must say not enough. Because at the end of the day, you need an expanded economy. Let me say this. Even for those doing national service now, many people are placed or given a location of where to work and they are sent back where there's no work for them to do. Now, many universities have, have, have taken a second look at such an important area as internship, which is crucial, you know, as a bridge between school and, and work. But they go and they bounce back because the place is flooded, you know. Um, so at that point in time, yes, relevance is important, but maybe the market ought to open up to absorb them in a situation where quite a number of industries will tell you we are, we are folding up our, or are laying off workers. How do I take 10, 20 students from Central University and train them? And these people coming in are coming in for free. You are not, don't have to pay them. But even for that, they have problems, um, you know. So we still need to work further on taking a second look at the issue of internship and move away from the stereotype of looking at the, the big businesses, you know, the telecos and so on and so forth. This is where we want to do internship. A critical look at areas from small scale industry to the highest point, um, creating openings uh, within all these areas to enable our uh, students uh, to fit. So the opening up of the economy becomes a much important um, aspect of the whole thing. Yes, we need to work on relevance. It is very, very important. Yes, something is being done, but we are not doing enough as a country. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. And let me congratulate uh, Professor Kwasi Yanka on his uh, nomination. And um, just to mention that I used to also be deputy minister in charge of tertiary education. And I appreciate the issues and believe that with your background in the public university and uh, in the private university, you definitely should be well placed to be able to address many of the issues. The major issue now in tertiary education is financing. And I think you just mentioned the challenges of financing as it pertains to running private universities. And you mentioned that the same problem of financing is also probably moving public universities to mission creep, as you uh, prefer to uh, define it. Now, we have a GET Fund. The GET Fund was fought for largely by tertiary institutions, the Ghana Education Trust Fund, GET Fund. And if you look at the objects of the fund, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six objects of the fund. Four of them specifically indicate that the fund is particularly to support tertiary 
education, both in terms of their infrastructure, in terms of scholarships for needy but brilliant students in tertiary education, and student loans for students in tertiary education. It does even differentiate between public and private. Yes, so I'm laying the foundation for my question. You know, when you're asking a professor a question, you have to, you have to lay a very good foundation. So, Professor, um, the funding is skewed towards public universities now, and even towards uh, pre tertiary. I have been engaging my brother, the new minister, on this issue. Will you, given your experience running a private university, demand equity in the distribution of the fund so that students in private universities are equitably catered for? I'm not saying give money to private universities. I'm saying that will you put in place a system that ensures that students in private universities are equitably and fairly treated in the distribution of the GET Fund money. Then I really would have wished while you were Deputy Minister, you would have taken that initiative. We would have saved ourselves this question. The truth of the matter is that we have been misled about the meaning and interpretation of the Get Fund Law. The public perception and the, the chorus of responses that we hear each time private universities want this or that, from infrastructure to scholarship to capacity building, the chorus is, no, we have to change the law before we could help private universities. Now you are rightly telling us that we don't have to change the law. The truth is there within the law. Apart from the area of infrastructure, where it is clearly stated that they are dealing with infrastructure within the public universities, for all those other five out of the six, whether scholarships, um, capacity building, name them, or grants, there is no distinction between private and public. They, are, they, are, they all have the right, or they both have the right to access it. It is this that we need to draw attention to, that we don't need to um, just delude ourselves that the GET Fund is for public universities. It is for all public and private institutions and tertiary education in general. The amount of money that private universities spend on capacity building, trying to help those with MPhil to do their PAD, the little budget you have to scrounge and squeeze and give to our colleagues to go and do their PhD, um, whether scholarships or the amount of money, seed money that you need to start a program in science and technology, which is the pivot, you can get it. And for that matter, many private universities have just given up. They would rather for, go for the business courses that need no capital investment. And you and I and the country is losing, are losing out entirely on the startup that we need to encourage science and technology within the private universities. Yes, that is one of the things that I need that uh, I have in mind to discuss with the sector minister, that we ought to fight voraciously to ensure that we clearly understand the Get Fund Law and that no private university is left behind just mainly because people are misinterpreting the law for their own political ends. Second one. The public universities, and I've, this matter I've also discussed with uh, the sector minister, 
public universities are all established by law and given the power to charge fees. Uh, you have just indicated that in terms of fees, the gap between the public and the private is closing. Even under circumstances where the infrastructure for the public is established by government and the salaries and emoluments, not all but significant portion of it is paid for by government and yet there is a narrowing of the gap when it comes to fees that they have to pay and there's even a more vexed question of some public universities having fee paying and so-called non-fee paying but even the non-fee paying actually pay fees but the fee paying i think pay according to commercial rates let me find out from you by law, any public agency that is given the power to charge fees must bring the fees to Parliament for Parliament to approve under the fees and charges, uh, I mean, LI. Um, fees and Charges Act. Can I get the assurance from you? since I, as your student, didn't do it as a deputy minister in charge of tertiary education. Can I get an assurance from you as my professor that you will do the right thing and get all the universities to bring their fees and charges for parliament to approve so that we can monitor the fees that they are charging students? We will. But at the same time, um, there is often the fear and, and suspicion that um, fees rightfully and truthfully declared um, suffer. The out of your own honesty, you, you tend to suffer for uh, being honest and, and open. Uh, I believe that the government will also be aware that um, the universities, the public universities themselves, um, want to as much as possible invest some of the money that they take in uh, in other areas of need, giving scholarships and so on and so forth. But yes, fundamentally, we will work with them towards declaring whatever they, um, they mobilize from within. I 100% agree with what the Honorable Minister has said. Uh, there have been policy directives in that direction too the National Council for Tertiary to insist that they do so from this year. But also to reassure the people that even declaring under the Internally Generated Funds Act, public universities or tertiary institutions are allowed to retain 100%. So it's not really to declare and we will take. Yeah, we will take no, that is not the point. The point is to declare so that Guyanians know what is charged for what. You have talked about Wikipedia. Yes, thank you. Seeing that you are a scholar, you have written a lot, and you are actually also uh, concerned about traditions and culture by your publications. And I just find it surprising that with the knowledge that you had as being a member of the committee, uh, the commission, you have not published any works, any academic work. On, on, on that disturbance and perhaps show a direction as to how that can be resolved and, and perhaps uh, how it can even be prevented. Do you have any plans of publishing any works as it relates to the Dagbong traditions as you came to learn it as a member of the commission? Well, yes and no. We were given a mandate, clear terms of reference articulated and we discharged our responsibilities in accordance with the terms that were given to us. But beyond that, you may find somewhere in my CV that shortly after the WACU report had been submitted and we had finished our assignment, I got a call from the United Nations, a very unlikely source, um, asking that 
uh, they didn't even know that I had worked on the Waco Commission, but based on my own academic um, interests in the ethnography of speaking, that they wanted to put together a team to help the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research Unit there to collaborate with international scholars to come out with a methodology by which the UN um, could very or much more easily settle into security zones for purposes of disarmament and so on, and that it would not be useful parachuting their way into any zone and just starting. So we met and deliberated on this with the number of scholars um, I represent in Africa. After that, they asked us if we could pilot the methodology that we, were, we had in mind in any area. And I suggested Dabon, partly because I've been directly interested, uh, I've directly been involved in the investigations. So the issue was they, they accepted my recommendations and we flew directly uh, to Yendi, Tamale area um, as, a, as part of a pilot project of determining whether the methodology that we had discussed off uh, the, 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 the zone could be applied. And at the end of the day, it was such a useful project. We were there for eight years, um, and it really worked. Investigating with, with the people there, the impact of the experience, of the war experience on them, on their lives and education and so on and so forth. And after that, you can tell from uh, one segment, one part of the CV, that we were invited to now present our findings in Dagbon, not the original, but the methodology. In Geneva, there's a conference that I attended in Geneva that, where I presented the report, the experience of our post dagon experience in seeking to understand the war better. That has not been published. It's, it's one write-up that I, I, I really wish I could get the opportunity to publish because I don't think it is sensitive and, and, and will rack any nerves. So yes, nothing has been published yet, but there's something that I have that, that I'm itching to publish, but nothing that is sentimental. A very important issue which engaged our attention when we were at the ministry. It has to do with aging faculty, aging faculty. Uh, I look at your personal experience. Um, if it had been in the public university space, you would have retired seven years ago. And a fine brain like yours, very strong man, would, uh, uh, if I am allowed to use the word, wasted, you may have been wasted. Uh, but fortunately, the private universities have you know, a more flexible arrangement. Uh, what will be your view on uh, taking a second look at the 60 years age retirement uh, within the higher education space, within the public higher education, uh, seeing that um, you have gone on to be of good help to Central University and some of your other colleagues. But in the public higher education space, unless you get an agreement or contract with the university, which really is very narrow and not everybody is fortunate to have that opportunity, will you look at that matter and what are your own personal views to do with uh, aging faculty and how we can resolve it and retain uh, our fine brains in our higher education institutions? Ghana and Africa, we, we have a, a youth bulge a big bulge there, um, unlike uh, we, are, we are the youngest continent, unlike the others, which even have a negative growth rate. We have several young men and women equally brilliant, and we were assuming their roles where they are now. Several years ago, we were also wishing that we would get the opportunity to grow and take over from the older ones. That's a natural um, 
process. So to begin with, fundamentally and morally, it is our social responsibility to ensure that we leave the scene when we have to and give way to the younger ones, passing down the wisdom instilled into the hearts and minds of the younger ones. And I, I think that's a fundamental thing that we have to stick to. You know, we have to train the younger, the future generation, train them. And it is our responsibility, each and every one of us, as a teacher, as a professor, to grow our kind and be proud and say that, yes, I'm beating my chest today that I trained this young man. I mentored him. Mentoring is a process and an institution that we shouldn't abandon. Leave the scene when your time is up, but make sure you have mentored. Just like cutting a tree and ensuring that you have planted one to replace the tree cut. Universities have very wisely decided that in certain situations of need, considering the youth bulge, that's important. But at the same time, in spite of that, there are certain individuals whose skills will still be needed even though they are fit 60 and all other things being equal. So therefore, they look at the graduate school where experience, academic experience counts a lot in training that level of manpower. So I also agree entirely with the decisions taken by universities that yes, you are entitled to work with us on contract, provided your skills can be utilized in certain areas, selective areas, and provided you yourself have attained a certain academic qualification. That is there. In the case of the private universities, very fortunately, for those who are still agile eh, and have hit 60, that's not the end of the world. They can take to other, several other things for which they are competent. But at the same time, find their way into the private universities, where, as you rightly pointed out, um, you know, you retire at 65 and have the possibility and, uh, and an option of even going further to 70. And even after 70, you can still remain and do part-time. So as far as brain work is concerned, there are no age barriers. But there's a youth bulge and our social responsibility to ensure that we leave when we have to leave and train younger ones that can replace us. With what has been described as massification in the sector, uh, the high number that some people say uh, of high number of uh, private universities. Meanwhile, uh, our higher educational system is still defined as elitist. We still have uh, many people who are not in there, who do not transition to that uh, category. Just about 17%, you know, of a cohort transition to a higher education space. As president of the Council of Independent Universities, I recall that we worked together on the issue of charters for private universities. Uh, fortunately, we had two targets for 2016. Uh, Central University College was achieved, but Ashesi University is still pending. It brings up the issue of the National Accreditation Board and how slow they sometimes are in, in, you know, in processing all of this. You have been advocating for a second look of the whole mentorship arrangement, affiliation arrangement, and the processes leading to the grant of a charter by His Excellency the President. Uh, what is your current position uh, on this matter, and what 
should we expect you to do as a Minister of State in charge of tertiary education in, uh, in addressing uh, this particular issue? Mr. Chairman, it's one of the lamentations of the private universities that there is absolutely no equity and fairness in a system where a public university has been established by law, but you cannot see it on the ground. Not a single brick, not a single mortar, no wall constructed to say that this university established by an act of parliament, I'm going to take you there and take you even in Sabi, into the bathroom. Excuse me to say. Let a private entrepreneur, you and I, any of my eldest behind me, think of starting a private university to help resolve this issue of massification, that you have a huge number of applicants waiting, into, waiting to enter the tertiary education sector but cannot do so for several reasons. Either the public universities are choked. So, so this new entrepreneur wants to start a university. He say my hometown, Duyakwa, in Sabah, wherever. This individual, after successfully and arduously been granted permission or accreditation by the National Accreditation Board to start a university, is going to operate under a mentor, Cape Coast, Legon, Kumasi. The law says for at least 10 years. But for 18 years, a newborn would have gone to a university, still waiting to be given autonomy or charter to enable that school or university to award their own certificate rather than the certificate of the mentoring institution. It's not fair. One is established by an act of parliament, and you've done so so many times and recently, where you cannot even find a school when you go there. You have to start there. And this other entrepreneur want to start a university has to wait for 18 years. Of course, he starts it. He's given a accreditation to start. But to be on his own, just like the one that you cannot see is on its own. If that university that's on, on, on its own and cannot see should start today, they are going to give their own degrees. They are not going to give the degrees of Cape Coast, Kumasi, or Legon. But let this our new entrepreneur interested in finding a way out of the massification decide that I'm starting a university to help out. Some of them break down in tears. Many cannot survive. Many private universities owe banks. Some have laid off their workers. Others are at the point of being sold out. So there's a suspicion that government or governments are interested in ensuring that they wipe out the private universities. There's no equity. So this is one thing that my good self and the minister, we are going to work towards equity, ensuring that they are treated equally, just that they are expected thank to you, be thank you, treated Prof. equally with a get fund. Thank you. Your, your point is very well made. Uh, those that have no breaks have accreditation, and, uh, and then those who have everything. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I, I'll come to the right. You're giving him one, then you have how many? Yeah, Prof. Uh, good afternoon and congratulations. When you were mentioning people you have mentored, I was getting scared that you exposed me as one of them. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, when Prof was a hall tutor, senior hall tutor, I was his sports secretary. And he also taught me a little at the English language department. So I owe a lot to him. But I'm taking him just one question, back to something that he has talked about for a long time. You've been a strong advocate of the use of folklore in the development of the language and its usage. 
that we should not abandon our folklore in developing the language, especially with the English language. That the folklore goes to enrich, <laughs> the folklore goes to enrich our language usage. Um, that was when you were teaching me issues about look, proverbs, the usage of proverbs and all those things. Now, English language, by a lot of researchers, the use and even the language, spoken language in secondary schools especially, and even at the universities, have gone down. The students are not doing too well. Meanwhile, the regime also to use local dialect in the teaching of school children, at least at the primary level, also becoming a problem. We search dichotomy, what do we do? In order to create a synergy, between the local dialect and English language usage, development and usage. And to the policy that says uh, pupils from kindergarten to um, P3, P3 should be taught through the medium of local, of the, of the mother tongue. And then from that point onwards, uh, and I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a policy that has not changed, but which has very brazenly been violated um, in several schools, uh, by private schools particularly. Yes, and I think that's a very good policy. That I think that there has been some misunderstanding about what that policy really means. It's from a distance. It looks like here is a policy that is going to discourage our children from learning to speak English. That is wrong. That's what, not what the policy is saying. It's saying that from the period between kindergarten and P3, that period when the child's mind is very, very fertile and is more closely associated with his or her homestead, let's not suddenly break the language use at home and suddenly introduce another language that is he or she is not familiar with. So whatever mother tongue that the parents speak to him in, let's maintain that. And then at that ripe and tender age, let's get him introduced to concepts in various aspects of education. Through that medium, go to any of my hometowns or yours for that matter and speak to kindergarten children who don't know much English. They display wonderful brilliance in everything they articulate, high, high level of maturity. Compare them by law to say that, no, in class, let's now speak English. You think they are dumb. And that is a colonial aspect of our heritage, that use an African language and you are dumb. Use English and you are brilliant. So just by an act of determinism, depending on where you, are, you were born, what language your mother speaks to you in, you are categorized. You were born in America, you are brilliant because you speak English. But it's just a methodology to ensure that a majority of the pupils do not miss out at that age. And don't forget that at that age, English is still a subject in the curriculum. They still have English. They still learn English. But as far as the medium is concerned, through which mathematics and other subjects should, should be learned, let's learn, get them to learn it through the medium that they know best, and then gradually introduce the English medium, you know, through and through from uh, the rest of the primary school, through DHS, to the SHS, to the university. That is all that the policy is saying. There are certainly exceptions to the rule everywhere. You can't start a policy that favors the minority, a fragment of, of people, a small percentage. 
use their case as the case for Ghana. So you start with the majority and find a way to help resolve other issues about multilingualism in certain sectors in, in places like Accra, which language you have to use. That's, that's a different matter. You have helped resolve the matter for a majority of them. Let's find a way out. So that policy is there. But the English thing is very, very important. You need to pass that to enter the core subject at SHS, get A1 to C6 to enter the university and, 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 and to enter senior high school and so on and so forth. That is essential. But the fact also remains that the quality of English um, is declining. A few days ago, I was working with my colleague, um, um, nephew, who is in the ministries, and I realized that wherever we entered, whichever en office we entered, he was speaking Pidgin English. <laughs> you know, to his peers. I mean, freely and unapologetically. And I, th I thought, well, why not? So I asked him the question, don't you think this lingo divert, no, adversely affects your spoken English? And as many linguists know, it does not necessarily. They just choose the situation in which they are, the peer relationship between them. And one would not really encourage this within the official sector, no. Um, but they, they speak the pidgin English to, to break the grounds, to facilitate um, communication with their peers. But when it comes to official business within the office, they make sure they use the standard English. The question is whether directly or indirectly, pigeonism doesn't seep unnoticeably uh, into their everyday um, standard English discourse. Prof, for the nomination to serve as a Minister of State in charge of tertiary education. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to inquisitive, being inquisitive, earlier he was asked about his membership of the MPP, he said he was. But is he a card bearing or just a, a, a sympathizer? I stopped the sympathizer, sympathizer thing long ago. I mean, card bearing member. Oh, okay, interesting. So since, since when, Prof? <laughs> Did you start I, carrying I, the card? I, I, you I don't remember? I can't. Um, I, I am a card bearing member. Okay, good. Earlier in an answer to a question, about the private universities and uh, your belief of uh, unfair treatment or not equal treatment meted out to them as against the public universities. I hope of you might have heard a number of times publications and even the National Accreditation Board going around struggling to shut down private universities because they were not properly accredited. I hope you've heard that. Yes, I did. And putting, just opposing that with how public universities are created, because right from day one, it is government establishment, so it is for public good. There no any other interest apart from public good. As against private universities, yes, there may be some that are done by organizations or even uh, faith based, which to a large extent, you say it is for public good, but there are also a lot more who are going into it for profit. And therefore, there's the need for us as a country to tread cautiously because of some profit motive to give uh, autonomy in order not to get this opportunity abused by some who are running for profit motive. Don't you think that may be the basis and is justified? Um, partly the basis. Now, let me also make a distinction between private universities that are not accredited. The company may have been registered as a company, but not accredited to operate. Mm? And say that you still have more than 30 private university colleges known 
um, to the accreditation board that don't have accreditation and may be operating. Let's move them aside. If the accreditation board were backed by law to physically go and close them down, they would. But the law leaves that to the law enforcement agencies, except for the new bill that is being considered, uh, which would now give them the power and authority to directly there. So they are very much interested in ensuring quality. Let's put them aside. You are talking now of the accredited mm, that don't have charter. That's the second, the accredited that don't have charter. These operate under the auspices of certain public universities, um, given the degrees of the public university and receiving mentorship. They send all their new programs to them and they look through and they have to ratify when, in, uh, when they are granting degrees, the bigger investors have to ratify and so on and so forth. So that is there. The fact remains that the accreditation board, in its wisdom, has the right at any time to shut down a particular program. Because during the re-accreditation process, what they do, they don't just give you accreditation and say, go ahead and operate eternally. They subject the program that you, in, you introduce to re-accreditation. They are coming to check whether you are still complying with the regulations as you did before, or you have relaxed your vigilance. So that is going on. That is a quality assurance exercise to ensure that at all times um, you do not um, cheat the students whose fees have been paid, and so on and so forth. So that is there. But a majority of them are law-abiding. And those that are not law-abiding, they are flushed out. Uh, Mr. Blackwell knows that. The rest are operating legally. And the rest produce as high-quality students as any other university elsewhere would. But having said all that, let's say that maybe if we want to talk about exercising mentoring and ensuring that the right thing is done, the private universities are not picked out for exceptional treatment. Let's apply it across the board. Let me give you just one example. If you look at the student lecturer ratio, both in the public universities and in the private universities, the private universities have an average of one lecturer to 41 students. That's the public. The private universities have an average ratio of one lecturer to 31 students. That's fact. But the public sector by dint of the fact they belong to the public sector, still is ex you know, exercising control over the private sector. The one with the worst ratio. So they'll ask you, what moral authority do you have to ex exercise control over me uh, who generally you know, are doing better? So there's that moral issue that we are not, the private investors are not necessarily the worst offenders. But because of the very nature of the system, you cannot go to University A, big University A, big University B, and, 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 and punish them or, or withdraw from them the mentorship authority that you give to them because the, the classrooms are more overcrowded than in the private universities. Yeah, but prof, they have entrained themselves. Uh, just, uh, is it not for these same reasons that you are talking about? that can you imagine that if they were given accreditation from day one, their ratio would be worse because they are under check. And remember what I said earlier, these public ones, yes, there may be some faculty of some departments 
that may be doing one little thing or that, maybe looking at more profit or getting money to help the faculty. But there's more tendency for the private university to be running towards profit than the, 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 the public. And also knowing very well, Prof, that the accreditation starts with the institution, then it goes to program accreditation. And because of all these technicalities involved, that is why you need to tread cautiously with the private, because if you are not then careful, because they are likely to go in for profit motive, if you are not careful, they may be rather creating a bigger problem for the educational system than maybe the public. I'm not in any way sanctioning that, or oh, if you say in 10 years, then you leave the institution for 18 years or even for 11 years. Once you say 10 years, you, may, you should be working assiduously to ensure that within that 10 years, you are able to give the accreditation. But don't you still believe that, as uh, I know, having headed uh, a private university or still heading a private university and coming from a public university, yeah, the frustration of being at a public university uh, is still dawning on you. But if it's to slow down so that we don't run into bigger problems with a, a private university. Yes, fundamentally, you are right. But let me make a distinction. You are talking about profit. A distinction between universities that were registered for profit and the non-profit ones. Though that registered and are limited by shares mm, that are going in for profit, and in which case that whenever there is any surplus, the shareholders pocket the money, those on one hand, and the non-profit ones that are limited by guarantee, and that is where most of the private universities belong. They don't call it profit from, from which anybody profits or pockets. The excess monies where they come are plowed back, invested in infrastructure, in science and technology, in capacity building, things that they would have looked to a get fund to have given generously. The little money left, and in this particular case, in 2013 came a law, a new tax law, that has gone to the extent of even taxing non-profit universities, apart from those that are for profit, and everybody knows that they're operating for profit, limited by. <laughs> even the non-profit universities, who otherwise would have used a surplus to re-engineer or revitalize the university. Now many of them have zero growth. Many of them are contemplating laying off workers. Some have ceased to exist. These are laws that are very unkind and that are very discriminatory. So the issue of profit, that issue has to be taken care of at one time or the other. I work with that, with the sector minister on that. But talking about the issue of mentorship, don't forget that for every private university or university colleges, college, they have two layers. They have a superintendent public university, big university A, big university B, and then the NAB, the accreditation board. So you're introducing a new program because people need that program to get work to do. And then you call on the Big Brother University. They examine your papers after, you know, it may take you an average of one and a half years or two years to have a new program launched. So they have finished their part. And then it's the turn of the National Accreditation Board. Um, and so on and so forth. So a double jeopardy. And meanwhile, students are waiting to subscribe to the course to walk into the world of work, just because of the bureaucracy. And don't forget, the bigger brother universities may be using the same consultants that the NAB would be using to examine your papers. So why don't you find a way of simply 
you know, simplifying, synchronizing, simplifying the process for the private sector. And unless you aim to discriminate against the private sector or kill its business, the new air blowing seeks to create an auspicious climate mm -hmm. for the private sector to operate. Okay, Prof. I think the, uh, a, a, a professor of communication, so he's like a, an MP who are just paid to talk. So if you are not careful, he will talk and there's a prof. I mean, I, uh, none of us around this table have doubts about your credential and your ability to impact positively wherever you are going. But the main challenge some of us have is one ministry, you have minister, you have minister of state, you have deputy ministers, our, our, our worry, our worry, especially in the past, especially in the past, have shown conflict, conflict and struggle for turf area. What assurance are you going to give this committee? I mean, knowing your experience and uh, tenacity, having worked all these years, as against my brother who is a lot of youthful exuberance. One trying to, oh, let's, is that like the independence later and independence now? You see, so how can we get assurance from you that as much as possible, you, you help to reduce conflict at the ministry? Thank you very much, um, uh, my very uh, good friend with whom I have a very good relationship. And also has two deputy ministers. I must say that um, most of these categorizations are rather artificial. Sector minister on one hand, minister of state in charge of tertiary, dealing with tertiary. The minister of state may be in charge of basic, whatever, dealing with basic, pre-tertiary. These are artificial demarcations. You are talking about a team, a team that is aware that whatever happens in the basic has consequences for tertiary and vice versa. And that we are operating on a client, a continuum, where lines are rather artificial. We are a single team. The sector minister is one to whom we all work, sector minister, in charge, in overall charge. You also have deputy ministers and along, who along with the, sec, with the um, Minister of State working together to have this, the, uh, the sector minister. The fact remains that at the level of a Minister of State, you are not the sector minister. You don't take decisions on your own. The buck stops with the sector minister. Thank you, Mr. But, uh, <laughs> Oh no. No, once 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 I get the answer, once I get the answer, I, I think I just try to help the challenges that confront us as a country today. And knowing that you've been an educationist for virtually all your very active life, the major concerns that we have today, I mean by my from my understanding, and as I observe, being a member of parliament for over a decade, is that discipline. There's so much indiscipline, and you wonder how we got our education from primary school to secondary school to finish university, and still have this huge indiscipline, and with a greater respect, some kind of sense of irresponsibility around us with state property, what have you. Going to the Minister of Education, I'm happy you said that you are going to work as a team. So even though you may be designated in charge of tertiary, you will also be helping to ensure that the general education in our country improves. What do you think we need to do differently from what we are currently doing to be able to get 
complete education so that people don't just go through pass exams and then once you pass exams and you finish you are the next thing you are looking for jobs and all the other things do not matter how what do you think we should do differently to to crush students who are not disciplined i mean it's tempting but that's not how to go about um, dealing with those perceived to be undisciplined. We are living in entirely different types of globalization, where students' habits, the habits of the young ones, teenagers, are tuned by the world out there. With the press of a small button, you are there, and you are learning habits. You are doing WhatsApp. You are doing Facebook. You are there out with them electronically. So cultures have naturally and understandably been polluted in one way or the other. I think the responsibility doesn't lie in seeking to crush the bad nuts, but first of all, understanding them and finding ways by which you can move about of those habits. It is a responsibility that should be taken by both parents and the institutions in which the students find themselves. And I'm very happy that within the NPP manifesto, they have pointed out that they are going to be interested in the nurturing of values. It's not just examination-oriented sort of thing that I'm trained that, and unfortunately, this is the situation now, for example, the three-year which ends up to be a two-and-a-half-year or two-year SHS. The student is only interested in how to pass. No opportunity to go out and do sports, to even visit other parts of the country where we are doing excursion, nurturing other skills. So it is so examination-driven that there is no room for discipline. I must say that in addition to the external habits that they imbibe. So I think it is a question that we all ought to answer by helping institutions institute measures, simply even how to keep, keep the students away from trouble is big enough, an assignment. How to ensure that the university has institutions that counsel them. The university has tutors or counselors. The universities have fellows associated with halls of residence uh, with whom students can interact and serve as an early warning signal that trouble is ahead of us. Let's watch out. Inviting them for counseling. And this is something that I think all of us um, should do, both as teachers, as professors, but also as parents. Prof, uh, uh, the very last but one. The challenge we have today, if you look at the number of graduates that we turn out, whether from the polytechnics that are now some technical universities or the universities, the sheer numbers and the mindset that I just have to finish university and then get a job. No initiative, nothing. Just everybody thinks that I just finish and I must get a job in their mind. How do you hope now that you will be assisting the minister largely on the tertiary end, what do you think we should be doing, especially the technical universities, equipping, equipping the technical university, maybe some of our curricula, how do we really get this in the minds of most of our girls so that by the time they finish, they will all not be looking to get job, but some will have the mindset to be creating job. What do you think we should be doing differently? To instill in students entrepreneurial skills, where you don't wait to be employed, but you start a job and employ others. But on the ground, the situation is very scary, as I pointed out. Even for those who chose certain professions, where just a few years ago you could just walk directly into a job. Physician assistantship students, nursing students, trained professionals who otherwise would be seen 
working. Some have sat at home for three, four years and are desperate looking for jobs. And even the opportunities hitherto available for internships have not all been closed up or saturated. So you are virtually stranded as an individual, let alone those who, are, who don't belong to professional areas, just the generalists within the humanities and the, and the general science courses. It is very, very scary. We have to work together on this. I have pointed out the need for both lecturers and students to ensure that within every university, you have what they call university-wide courses that are expected to make you much more flexible even within your outside your own area of competence. In case of emergency, you can rely on other skills. But what is really happening also that jobs are not there, but people are still hiring. Hiring is still going on. It means that the competition is stiffer and stiffer. And that employers now rely on other skills beyond the classroom. Your capacity to think on your feet, your sense of initiative, your leadership skills. Quite a number of big companies out there in the world have abolished the art of looking for what great you got. Let's now look at the first class people first. That's a thing long gone. People now make decisions not on what you have on paper, but how you conduct yourselves, yourself at interviews. Yes, it's now the face-to-face -face helping to determine mm -hmm. your worth, not based on what you have on paper. And that is where we need a holistic type of education for the students, because you don't know which of the multiple skills you have will be called on um, to get a job for you. Mm -hmm. Prof, I perfectly agree with you. I know a company, I will just not mention their name. They've conducted 10 interviews, and they need just one sales manager. They said there's something they call, uh, it's a, like a hotel. They say the tracking system around the world, how to track bookings. And they've conducted 10 interviews. They couldn't get one person to occupy that, and they are still conducting interviews, meaning what you are saying is true. But my last question, Prof, you have been working all these years. You've even get the opportunity now to head a private university. Unions, unions at the tertiary level, and the FUSAG, and the rest of them. How do you hope to manage the expectations of unions now that? You, yes, in your current capacity, yes, you take some of those decisions as a, a vice chancellor. But now that you're going to be in charge of tertiary education, how do you hope to manage the expectations of unions at the tertiary level? It's still in our own minds and minds of others, is the fact that whether students or staff or faculty, we swim or sink together. Um, it is not um, workers on this end and management or, or you know, at the other end, one taking decisions and imposing decisions on the rest of them. It calls on the entire corporate body, the entire family, to bear this in mind, that if we do well together, we enjoy the outcome together. Um, if our own level of productivity is so low and there are problems with our company, with our institution, we all sink together. Fortunately, um, not many are sinking. They are surviving somehow. I think this, and secondly, the importance of involving staff and the rest of the faculty in decision-making processes. 
In other words, democratizing decision making and ensuring that they are not imposed right by management on students uh, or on workers. We are in it together, ensuring that there is adequate representation by the various stakeholders at various levels of decision making so that they themselves make their own input. When you get that and you are able to buy the mutual trust between you and your workers, I think you are at peace. Now, finally, the skills of negotiations should be brought to bear at all times. Talk, talk, talk. Appreciate where they are coming from. Yes, empathize. Yes, I know where you are coming from. But can we do it this way? Can we do it that way? Uh, and let them also empathize with you, imagining themselves wearing the shoes that you are wearing. But I think all these need negotiations and negotiations and jaw jawing between the various parties. Yeah, Prof, thank you very much and congratulations. Um, Prof, I have one question. If you ask me, Ghana, we have so much gold and other rich natural uh, minerals from the beach to Pualugu. But unless other people come with the technology, we can't enjoy our wealth. We have such huge potential for agriculture. Unless other people come with that technology, we still continue to use the rudiments. How would our education be tailored to make us take advantage of the bountiful uh, um, resources that God has blessed this country with? Uh, quite a few remarkable examples of countries without resources, except the knowledge resources that have survived and has excelled. It is quite clear within this government's intentions and even in documents from the NCT that science and technology would be the driver of the academic world and development as a whole. You will also realize that right from various policy statements and documents within the ministries, the 60-40 ratio has been over and over and over again emphasized that we need eventually to have a 60% science students and 40% um, humanities or non-science students. I don't know who is monitoring this to ensure compliance with this very, very, very important project. If you disaggregate and move away from the generalities where it has to be 60-40, and you go to even the science universities. Of course, Kenya University has been fairly consistent. Um, it, is still, it still has about 62% science enrollment, uh, the, the rest in non-science. Um, but at the overall level, tertiary level, the imbalance is still there, heavily tilted towards the humanities. And even within polytechnics, which started very nicely in the 80s and 90s um, with about 65 to 70% science, have now declined. The science component is now about 33%. So the original core mandate of ensuring that they train, um, you know, middle to high level technological or technical students, that has been completely abandoned so the thing to do is that with the introduction of the technical universities, the big challenge confronting us is how to ensure that they stick to the rules and do not slide into the direction where all the polytechnics um, have been sliding. So technical universities yet, yes, but let's make sure that the documentation and the regulations governing they are being instituted these are complied with, and we, they will stick to the mandate that these are technical universities and not future humanities universities. Because I really think that uh, there must be something wrong with our training such that a civil engineer in England, just for his degree, he will create something 
which will serve his community. But a master's uh, a, a PhD engineer here will, will, will hardly create uh, a machine for planting. Well, I, I, will plant. not, I, I will not denigrate them to that extent. So. Uh, you know, so um, what kind of sciences have we done in the past such that we still have to depend on others for simple tools? Simple tool for improving our farming ground, we can't. We have to um, give them more money. I was starting the example of when we started Radio Universe at the University of Ghana long ago. Our transmitter broke down, and we had to communicate with the manufacturers who were in London, telling them our transmitter has broken down. We were not able to go back on air for two weeks. So they sent somebody down to help us. Um, and I was expecting the MD himself. So, but here came this 17-year-old boy coming from England. And I, I say, I'm, I'm Tom. I'm, I've come to fix your, your, your transmitter for you. This was a polytechnic student who had been sent down all the way from England. And whereas we had made arrangements for, for housing for him to stay overnight, possibly two nights, and do the work. He finished the work within one and a half hours and joined the next flight <laughs> back to England. So where are polytechnic students um, who could have simply done the same? That middle level, we seem to be losing that gap. Very well. I think now the ball is in your court.